Then we go to VGG. Any questions about the architecture, local response normalization, and data augmentation? So the idea of VGG was you can work with three by three convolutions. And actually you can replace uh, five by five because it's gonna have the same receptive field and has two three by three convolutions on top of each other. So the idea is that rather than having a bigger kernel, you can make your network deeper. And these are very deep convolutional neural networks. And these architectures are, you use them in practice a lot. Even the pre-trained ones, you're gonna use them. For instance, VGG 16, VGG 19. Any questions about LRN and data augmentation? So we are gonna come back to data augmentation a lot. These neural networks usually have a high capacity, a lot of parameters. The input data, one way to regularize is to take a look at your input data and augment it. Another way to regularize was using dropout or perhaps global average pool link is another way to regularize so that your network doesn't overfit to your training data. You can uh, regularize even at the softmax level. We are gonna see that later on. So there is gonna be regularization everywhere. There's gonna be weight decay, which is similar to L2 penalty. This is one way of regularizing local response normalization. People don't use it too much when you do classification, but when we are gonna do generative networks, these types of ideas are coming back. Yes, so the question is, so data augmentation is providing additional data to train in this concept, and it's not the same with multi-column. Multi-column was looking at different perspectives of your data and pushing them through your network and in the end reporting the average. Data augmentation is increasing the size of your data. Let's say you have one single data point, one single image, and then you look at different crops of it, maybe five crops, the one on the left, the one on the right top, right below, left below, and the one on the center. These are five crops. This is as if you're translating your image. And we know that the class shouldn't depend on translations. It means that a single image, we can turn it into five images. In the end, if your initial data set had a size of 1 million, after all of these crops, it's gonna end up being 5 million data points to work with. So yes, it's different from what you are seeing with uh, multi-column. The question is, are there methods of data augmentation that make the network more robust during testing when compared to others? That's a great question. And actually we are gonna investigate data augmentation throughout the course through the means of different papers. And then when we go to AutoML, automatic machine learning, you can actually learn good data augmentation techniques based on, the based on the performance on your validation data. So you can think of data augmentation as another hyperparameter that you can actually learn. Yeah, these are exciting stuff. There is another question on the chat. If training our model takes a long time and we don't want to iterate over all of the combination of hyperparameters for number of hidden layers, number of nodes within the hidden layer and convolution. Is, the, is there a general rule of thumb for a good place to start for object recognition? Uh, the architectures that we are going through, for instance, this architecture, VGG19 or VGG16, is a good place to start or even ResNet that we are gonna cover later on. You can start building up upon them. And you're right, you're not gonna have enough resources to brute force through all of the possibilities. But as, as you learn more and more, and as you code more and more, and as you write, as you do your assignments more and more, you're gonna get more and more comfortable with how to design your neural networks. So deep learning is, both an art and science. The way you design your architecture could sometimes be an art. You need to have some engineering mindset. Does data augmentation ever cause overfitting issues because it is reusing data in some sense? It's actually to prevent overfitting. The more data you have, the less your model is prone to overfitting. And the role of that data augmentation is to increase the size of your data. You know some invariances about images. For instance, if you take the image of 
a goldfish shifted to the right, it should still be classified as a goldfish. And therefore, your network is seeing different perspectives, different uh, views of the same object. So it's actually designed to prevent overfitting. It's designed to do regularization. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Is a multi-column deep neural network made up of convolutional neural networks? Yes, of course. So for that multi-column deep neural network that we saw, each column is a CNN. So you could rename the paper to be multi-column CNN, but we don't have that option. Somebody else wrote that paper, so we are going to go with that, multi-column deep neural networks. But the idea is general. It doesn't have to be a convolution. It could be a recurrent. It could be fully connected. It could be transformers. And you can have multiple column of them. That idea is really useful when you want to use more GPUs rather than only one on your computer. And is that a feasible architecture to start with? If you have multiple GPUs, yes. Okay. Any other questions about that augmentation, normalization, and VGG? So you are going to hear VGG a lot. So it's a good idea to know what is the architecture like. So they are using a lot of three by three convolutions. And they are not using global average pooling. They're just flattening and then using fully connected. 